Take your seats. I hope everyone enjoyed the appetizers. Don't forget about the classic books that we're selling, as well as the 50-50 raffle that we're selling out in the lobby, and the food. It's really good. I just had some chicken. Um, soon you will be hearing from this panel of local professionals discussing issues revolving around being colorblind or color brave, and why we need to strive to be color brave, especially within the workforce. We hope this discussion will help all of you. Before we begin, I would like to direct your eyes to the mics at the ends of the rows. Um, that's so that you can come up and ask questions. Before I introduce our panelists, I would like to introduce a man that is very supportive of the National Society of Black Engineers, our Dean of Students, Kevin Penn. When you watch it, it talks about what's there between being colorblind or color gray. And I think we all want to believe we're colorblind. It, it doesn't matter. It doesn't impact choices we make. Uh, my family this past summer, we uh, had the opportunity to complete an adoption. We went to China. So we have a young man in our family who has Chinese descent. And um, it's been interesting. He goes to a preschool locally. And um, he finally started being able to say who his friends are in English. So I got to go one day, wanted to meet who Alexa was, Ease, and um, Andrew. They're all Chinese. And he's in a class with you know mostly you know uh, white children, but there are a few Chinese students obviously in the class. And it was just interesting to me that my son was already you know his group of friends as he came here were, were of Chinese descent. And there's nothing wrong with that, but it just shows us it's uh, we're not colorblind, right? And I think about some of our experiences we had in China too, where really you know it's always a beauty different than everybody else. Just walking to a Walmart, I got asked for autographs. I got pictures taken of me. It never happens here. And I was just, when I was in China, I was just a sweaty mess the whole time because it was very hot. <clears throat> but you know, and I thought about it, and it, race is always one of the most, is like the video said, is a very uncomfortable conversation, especially in our country for us to have. I think one part of it is we all want to believe we solve the problems of race. So when do we have that moment where we can say we don't need to have this discussion anymore because everything's okay? Uh, well, you know. When we look at it, a lot of the things that we're very good at is because we constantly talk about them. We always want to improve them. So that's one of the main reasons why we need to always talk about race and differences about us in our society. And then I thought about two different examples that uh, really stood out. Uh, one is most people know me, know I love sports. And so I often explain things with sports analogies and uh, they provide great motivation to me. But sports about has, if you look at American society, has been where a lot of discussions about race have had to come out to the forefront. Uh, most of us know who Jackie Robinson is, regardless of if he like baseball or not, uh, because we know what that moment meant. Well, there's a coach from the Alabama uh, Crimson Times that's very famous, not Nick Saban if you follow college football now, but Coach Paul Bear Bryant. Paul Bear Bryant, when he was the coach at Alabama, was the most successful coach in America at that time. In the 1960s, he won three national championships. Every one of his teams at Alabama at that point were all white. Now, if you know something about the demographics of Alabama, there are a lot of African Americans that live in, in Alabama. And it was unusual to have, at this point, things were changing in our country. Now, there was this other team in the 60s that was doing really well, and that was the uh, University of Southern California. Now, USC was a fully integrated team. Well, in 1970, the NCAA changed their rules, and they said, basically, you can add a 12 team. So what most schools did, and if you follow college football, you know, they add a really small school place, they sell their stadium and their team wins and they make a lot of money. But Paul Bear Bryant had been trying to get his administration and his fans to understand, we need to integrate our team, we want to continue to be competitive. So he flew out to Los Angeles, he knew the coach of USC, John McCain, he said, hey, I want to invite you guys to come play against us in Alabama. Now we both have great programs, let's see what we can do against each other. 
And this would be close to chaos and reservations because at that point, an integrated team had not played an away game at Alabama either. So it was a big decision for him to make. But they made the decision. They went down to Alabama and they beat the Alabama 42 to 21. And most people who know the stories of Coach Kerr Bryant, he's one of those serious football coaches that never would crack a smile. Uh, you just were scared when you walk in a room with him. Instead, at the end of the game, the cameras caught something really interesting about him. He's smiling the whole time as he walks off the field. Because he finally knew he could go to his administration, he could go to his fan base and say, hey, you want to win national championships in the future? You want to be successful? You want to be competitive? We will integrate our team. Go embrace diversity, in other words. And that led to Alabama finally saying, you know what? Maybe we'll look at this. And of all their great history, a locally, a uh, young man named Mark Ingram won the Heisman Club in 19, uh, it would have been 2009. And that would have never happened. That moment doesn't happen in 1970 with Alabama. It led me to think of a company locally. A few years ago, back I was at their corporation, and they had these wonderful displays of steering wheels. Uh, each steering wheel was designed differently. Some were out of uh, different materials, uh, different colors, different shapes. And what they did is they wanted to show the diversity of their work staff and how that led to different ideas. And so why is it important for us to talk about race? Well, I think, number one, we all want to be better people. At the end of the day, we all want to believe we're uh, loving and caring people, so it's important to talk about race. But let's also talk about our country. There are some countries that are very competitive against us nowadays. And we want to always have a good economy. Why? It sustains our lifestyles. It allows us to have opportunity. Then we have to be good at managing diversity and race. The great countries, the great companies, manage that well. So today, you know, it's, it's, a, it's our opportunity to have maybe some uncomfortable questions. And as I've learned over time, uh, people who are different than have maybe a different practice something different than me or look different than me, they, they don't mind answering questions if it's coming from the heart. Uh, they're going to explain that to me. So let's have that conversation and let's continue to make our country great. Because it is through diversity and embracement that will make our country great. So with that, I want to just thank Nesby for having us here and turn it back over to Dr. Alan Michelle. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Finn, for that wonderful explanation on the importance of this event. I'm going to take this moment to introduce you to our panelists. As I say your name, can you please stand? The first panelist I will introduce you to is the president and CEO of Lawrence Technological University, Dr. Brenda K. Margill. President Margill has been the president and CEO of LTU since 2012 and overseen a period of significant growth of enrollment, fundraising, community outreach, and the construction of the third student dorm set to open in 2015. President Mayville has a master's in science and PhD from Banaras Hindu University, postdoctoral in molecular medicine from Mayo Clinic, and studied at the Harvard Institute for Educational Management. Our next panelist is very much like a big sister to me, Allison Vaughn. She is the founder and CEO of Jackets for Jobs Incorporated, a nonprofit organization that provides employment etiquette, career skills training, and professional clothes to low income individuals. Ms. Vaughn is a sought after speaker and award winning entrepreneur and co author of the book. Inspired Style. Since the opening of Jackets for Jobs in 2000, the organization has assisted over 15,000 individuals with employment. The high-profile organization has been spotted and applauded, has been supported and applauded by Donald Trump's ABC's The View, NBC's Today Show, and Oprah's O Magazine. A highlight of her career was the distinct honor of ringing the closing bell on NASDAQ twice. Our next panelist is a replacement for um, Dean Moore. Um, his name is Brandon Bryant. He's a program engineer at Cooper Standard Automotive in Novi, Michigan. He has worked in the automotive setting um, in the ceiling industry for three years, focusing primarily on Ford products and has a Bachelor's of Science in Mechanical Engineering 
from Central Michigan University. Brandon has participated in engineering projects domestically and abroad and is a student of the effects of race in engineering. <laughs> Next, we have a very active professor and supporter, Dr. Scott Snyder. Dr. Snyder has been teaching at LTU since the fall of 1992. He completed his bachelor's in physics at Rochester University, I mean, sorry, Rochester Institute of Technology in Rochester, New York, and his PhD in physics from the University at Albany. He teaches sophomore physics, upper level physics, and intro to astronomy courses. His interests in teaching revolve around teaching methods and astronomical calculations. He is also the faculty advisor for the Society of Physics Students, out at LTU with friends, and the Delta Phi Epsilon Sorority. He's an associate professor of physics and the director of the Center for Teaching and Learning at LTU. Our next panelist is also a replacement for Anthony Davis. Her name is Michelle Larsosa. <laughs> she is a graduate of Wayne State University. She received her bachelor's of science in electrical engineering and a master's of arts and communications. She began her technical career as an intern at General Motors and soon became a manufacturing engineer in their controls, robotics, and welding group. In 2008, Michelle began working for the Department of Defense as a logistics equipment specialist. Around the same time, she began her studies in communications and media studies at Wayne State. Michelle's studies in film and media technology and art have led her to to the founding of BME Media Group, LLC. The company focuses on creating and producing film and video projects while utilizing the latest industry technology. Michelle is currently serving as the Vice Chair of the National Society of Black Engineers Detroit Professional Chapter. Now we'll watch the TED Talk on Color Blind or Color Prey. calls me, he's running for U.S. Senate in Tennessee. And he says, Melody, I desperately need some national press. Do you have any ideas? So I had an idea. I called a friend who was in New York at one of the most successful media companies in the world, and she said, why don't we host an editorial board lunch for Harold? You come with him. Harold and I arrive in New York. We are in our best suits. We look like shiny new pennies. And we get to the receptionist and we say, we're here for the lunch. She motions for us to follow her. We walk through a series of corridors, and all of a sudden we find ourselves in a stark room, at which point she looks at us and she says, where are your uniforms? <laughs> Just as this happens, my friend rushes in. The blood drains from her face. There are literally no words, right? And I look at her and I say, now, don't you think we need more than one black person in the U.S. Senate? Now, Harold and I, we still laugh about that story. And in many ways, the moment caught me off guard. But deep, deep down inside, I actually wasn't surprised. And I wasn't surprised because of something my mother taught me about 30 years before. You see, my mother was ruthlessly realistic. I remember one day coming home from a birthday party where I was the only black kid invited. And instead of asking me the normal motherly questions like, did you have fun or how was the cake? My mother looked at me and she said, how did they treat you? I was seven. I did not understand. I mean, why would anyone treat me differently? But she knew. And she looked me right in the eye and she said, they will not always treat you well. Now race is one of those topics in America that makes people extraordinarily uncomfortable. You bring it up at a dinner party or in a workplace environment, it is literally the conversational equivalent of touching the third rail. There's shock, followed by a long silence. 
And even coming here today, I told some friends and colleagues that I plan to talk about race, and they warned me. They told me, don't do it. That there would be huge risks in me talking about this topic. That people might think I'm a militant black woman and I would ruin my career. And I have to tell you, I actually for a moment was a bit afraid. Then I realized the first step to solving any problem is to not hide from it. And the first step to any form of action is awareness. And so I decided to actually talk about race. And I decided that if I came here and shared with you some of my experiences, then maybe we could all be a little less anxious and a little more bold in our conversations about race. Now, I know there are people out there who will say that the election of Barack Obama meant that it was the end of racial discrimination for all eternity, right? But I work in the investment business, and we have a saying, the numbers do not lie. And here, there are significant, quantifiable racial disparities that cannot be ignored in household wealth, household income, job opportunities, health care. One example from corporate America. Even though white men make up just 30% of the U.S. population, they hold 70% of all corporate board seats. Of this Fortune 250, there are only seven CEOs that are minorities. And of the thousands of publicly traded companies today, thousands, only two are shared by black women. And you're looking at one of them, the same one who not too long ago was nearly mistaken for kitchen help. So that is a fact. Now, I have this thought experience that I play with myself, experiment. When I say, imagine if I walked you into a room and it was of a major corporation like ExxonMobil, and every single person around the boardroom were black, you would think that were weird. But if I walked you into a Fortune 500 company and every around the table is a white male, when will it be that we think that's weird too? And I don't know how we got here. I know how we got here. You know, there was institutionalized, at one time legalized discrimination in our country. There's no question about it. But I still, as I sort of grapple with this issue, my mother's question hangs in the air for me. How did they treat you? Now, I do not raise this issue to complain or in any way elicit any kind of sympathy. I have succeeded in my life beyond my wildest expectations. And I've been treated well by people of all races more often than I have not. I tell the uniform story because it happened. I cite those statistics around corporate board diversity because they are real. And I stand here today talking about this issue of racial discrimination because I believe it threatens to rob another generation of all the opportunities that all of us want for all of our children, no matter what their color or where they come from. And I think it also threatens to hold back businesses. You see, Researchers have coined this term colorblindness to describe a learned behavior where we pretend that we don't notice race. If you happen to be surrounded by a bunch of people who look like you, that's purely accidental. Now, colorblindness, in my view, doesn't mean that there's no racial discrimination and there's fairness. It doesn't mean that at all. It doesn't ensure it. In my view, colorblindness is very dangerous because it means we're ignoring the problem. There was a corporate study that said that instead of avoiding race, the really smart corporations actually deal with it head on. <coughs> they actually recognize that embracing diversity means recognizing all races, including the majority one. But I'll be the first one to tell you, this subject matter can be hard, awkward, uncomfortable, but that's kind of the point. In the spirit of debunking racial stereotypes, the one that black people don't like to swim, I'm going to tell you how much I love to swim. I love to swim so much that as an adult, I swim with a coach. And one day, my coach had me do a drill where I had to swim to one end of a 25-meter pool without taking a breath. And every single time I failed, I had to start over. And I failed a lot. By the end, I got it. When I got out of the pool, I was exasperated and tired and annoyed. And I said, why are we doing breath-holding exercises? And my coach looked at me and he said, Melody, that was not a breath-holding exercise. That drill was to make you comfortable being uncomfortable, because that's how most of us spend our days. 
If we can learn to deal with our discomfort and just relax into it, we'll have a better life. So I think it's time for us to be comfortable with the uncomfortable conversation about race. Black, white, Asian, Hispanic, male, female, all of us. If we truly believe in equal rights and equal opportunity in America, I think we have to have real conversations about this issue. We cannot afford to be colorblind. We have to be color brave. We have to be willing as teachers and parents and entrepreneurs and scientists, we have to be willing to have proactive conversations about race with honesty and understanding and courage. Not because it's the right thing to do, but because it's the smart thing to do. Because our businesses and our products and our science, our research, all of that would be better with greater diversity. Now, my favorite example of color bravery is a guy named John Skipper. He runs ESPN. He's a North Carolina native, quintessential Southern gentleman, white. He joined ESPN, which already had a culture of inclusion and diversity, but he took it up a notch. He demanded that every open position have a diverse slate of candidates. Now, he says the senior people in the beginning bristled, and they would come to him and say, do you want me to hire the minority, or do you want me to hire the best person for the job? And Skipper says his answers were always, always the same, yes. And by saying yes to diversity, I honestly believe that ESPN is the most valuable cable franchise in the world. I think that's a part of the secret sauce. And I can tell you in my own industry, at Earl Investments, we actually view our diversity as a competitive advantage. And that advantage can extend way beyond business. There's a guy named Scott Cage at the University of Michigan. He's the first person to develop a mathematical calculation for diversity. He says if you're trying to solve a really hard problem, really hard, that you should have a diverse group of people, including those with diverse intellects. The example that he gives is the smallpox epidemic. When it was ravaging Europe, they brought together all these scientists and they were stumped. And the beginnings of the cure to the disease came from the most unlikely source, a dairy farmer. A dairy farmer who noticed that the milkmaids were not getting smallpox. And the smallpox vaccination is bovine-based because of that dairy farmer. Now I said, I'm sure you're sitting here and you're saying, I don't run a cable company, I don't run an investment firm, I am not a dairy farmer, what can I do? And I'm telling you, you can be color brave. If you're a part of a hiring process or an admissions process, you can be color gray. If you are trying to solve a really hard problem, you can speak up and be color gray. Now, I know people will say, but that doesn't add up to a lot. And I'm actually asking you to do something really simple. Observe your environment <laughs> at work, at school, at home. I'm asking you to look at the people around you purposefully and intentionally invite people into your life who don't look like you, don't think like you, don't act like you, don't come from where you come from. And you might find that they will challenge your assumptions and make you grow as a person. You might get powerful new insights from these individuals. Or, like my husband who happens to be white, you might learn that black people, men, women, children, we use body lotion every single day. Now, I also think that this is very important so that the next generation really understands that this progress will help them because they're expecting us to be great role models. But I told you my mother, she was ruthlessly realistic. She was an unbelievable role model. She was the kind of person who got to be the way she was because she was a single mom with six kids in Chicago. She was in the real estate business where she worked extraordinarily hard but oftentimes had a hard time making ends meet. And that meant sometimes we got our phone disconnected or our lights turned off or we got evicted. And when we got evicted, sometimes we lived in these small apartments that she owned, sometimes in only one or two rooms because they weren't completed. And we would heat our bath water on hot plates. But she never gave up hope, ever. And she never allowed us to give up hope either. This brutal pragmatism that she had, I mean, I was four and she told me, mommy is Santa. I was, she was this brutal pragmatism. She taught me so many lessons, but the most important lesson was that every single day she told me, 
Melody, you can be anything, anything. And because of those words, I would wake up at the crack of dawn. And because of those words, I would love school more than anything. And because of those words, when I was on a bus going to school, I dreamed the biggest dreams. And it's because of those words that I stand here right now, full of passion, asking you to be brave for the kids who are dreaming those dreams today. You see, I want them to look at a CEO on television and say, I can be like her, or he looks like me. And I want them to know that anything is possible, that they can achieve the highest level that they ever imagined, that they will be welcome in any corporate boardroom, or they can lead any company. You see this idea of being the land of the free and the home of the brave? It's woven into the fabric of America. America, when we have a challenge, we take it head on. We don't shrink away from it. We take a stand. We show courage. So right now, what I'm asking you to do, I'm asking you to show courage. I'm asking you to be bold. As business leaders, I'm asking you not to leave anything on the table. As citizens, I'm asking you not to leave any child behind. I'm asking you not to be colorblind, but to be color brave, so that every child knows that their future matters and their dreams are possible. Thank you. perception or is this the perception because I think there's a, a little bit of a difference there um, I think the perception of just at, at least in this day and time and at least in this country um, to really understand is you have to look back at how race uh, has been perceived you know over time uh, over time I mean race has really been one of the most contentious issues in this country's history I mean, if you think about like slavery and some of the you know the ghettos that we had and um, you know some of the other races um, it's really, really been uh, a lot of a lot of issues. So a lot of times when the, it's been brought up, I mean, it's always been an argument. Somebody getting berated, somebody getting abused, or you know something like that. Um, so I mean, naturally, a lot of people when they hear race come up, they all they kind of tense up and they kind of freeze up when they when they hear something coming. Um, so back to the question, uh, the perception I think of being color brave. Um, I think at least initially when it comes up, it's everybody kind of tenses up. Uh, I don't want to talk about it. Maybe this person is uh, is going to you know berate me. Maybe they're going to you know call me a racist or something like that. Um, but honestly, I mean obviously that's not really the case. Um, I mean personally, when I think about being you know, a color brave person, I mean it's just opening up the discussion. So I mean, um, so I mean for the uh, betterment of uh, you know whatever you're doing. I mean I think later we're going to talk about. Um, you know, companies and things like that. But just like Melody uh, Hobson said, uh, when you uh, when you limit yourself to one certain race and you don't have this discussion, um, you're limiting yourself. I mean, you're you're, you're purposely uh, leaving out different ideas. I mean, diversity. And I think that ultimately hurts. Well, I think like uh, Melody said that it's important to learn how to be comfortable while being uncomfortable. So I think uh, for most of us, and I'll speak for myself in particular, uh, when I was at General Motors, I had a hard time, I guess, fitting in or getting to the group of being in corporate America and um, dealing with different situations that would arise at work, right in the middle of the plant 
floor or in um, a weekly meeting. Um, we have to accept, you know, who we are. We can't change how we look, or at least my personal belief is we, we shouldn't. But um, the truth is that people may not always treat you well. And there just comes a point in time where you shouldn't run from it or hide from it. If anything, I guess I would say is to let down your guard and your barriers and, and in essence, welcome the prospect of having um, an adversary, if you will. And it's not necessarily the person that's the adversary, but the ideals that they may represent. If they are against African Americans, if they're against women, just be willing to not necessarily to take on and internalize those negative perceptions, but be willing to understand the place where they come from. And in, in return, be willing to show the place where you come from. Well said, I agree with um, the other two panelists. Um, being color brave to me is just being open-minded and not being tunnel vision on color barriers. I believe in um, having a diverse group of friends, um, working in a diverse work environment, and so just being color brave is just being very open-minded and um, being able to diversify yourself. I think getting out of your own particular color bubble, uh, I spent most of my life in basically a white middle class sort of bubble. And it's really been the last couple of years uh, that I've gotten into situations where I found myself in a complete sexual minority or a complete gender minority. There was 250 undergraduate physics women in the audience and there's two guys. I'm one of them, and uh, in a complete, uh, just in the minority is an unusual situation for me. I found all of those particular experiences fascinating to, to know that not only the people that I brought with me to these events, they were now in the majority and they weren't often in the majority in any walk of life where they're, they're leading their lives. So to have them be in the majority and me be in the minority was a fascinating experience for me. So I think being aware of where you are and what faces are you seeing every day, and can you hang out with other faces or be open to other conversations with other faces. I think that's the color, brown, color brave or diversity brave. I think from my perspective, we are an academic institution. Most problems in the world are due to lack of education, information, and perception is part of that. Major changes, the brave men and women who changed the world, the first thing they knew about was being truthful to yourself and to people you work with. One of the criteria I have used, in, I've been into academic world for 45 years now almost, from master to doctoral and rest of administrative work as faculty and chairman and so forth. One criteria I have used and I have found solace and peace in that, that if I ever did something wrong or perceived to be wrong because there was a favoritism involved or there would be much problem if I went this way or that way or I made the decision right with absolutely good, pure intention, whoever is concerned. But when I went to bed, something bothered me. Only you know, nobody knows that. And I would not go to sleep until I corrected what I thought was the wrong decision. And I have done that in life, in personal life, in professional life. You have to be true to yourself. Secondly, you have to believe in yourself. All the countries in the world, over 200 now, with some exception which have inherited, whether it's oil wealth or some other issues, all those countries that are not inclusive of their population are very poor. It's an economic fact. So if we are in, a, in an environment where we feel by excluding some people we are better off, that's totally wrong. Because the history tells us all those countries which prevent some people of their community from coming into mainstream, they're literally very poor. The wealth is concentrated in few families or few areas. The rest of them are poor. The United States have a great leverage. We have a long way to go, but yet we were more inclusive, comparatively speaking. Women came in workforce after World War. 
We were not a great nation in terms of economic power. It was Germany and England before that, World War I, World War II. The euro was all destroyed. Now men went to war, so women took on the role, nurses, teachers, and officers. Used to be male secretaries before. So when you have this workforce coming in, whether it's a gender issue or whether it's a color issue, the more they came in, the better we looked, the economy went on, we became the, the world's top economic power. But inclusion, not complete, but better than what we had. So I think the country can, cannot afford not to use its strength in people. I'll just say one thing about historically, there was a great Nobel laureate, India's first Nobel laureate, uh, in poet laureate, Ravindranath Tagore, very famous. A lot of his writing, poetry, has been turned into novels and movies and so forth. Very, he wrote two national anthems, one for Bangladesh, one for India. Very powerful writer. He, in one of his poems, A Line and Life, and it, it affects all of us in the audience and more, whether the leaders in Washington or here, he, he said, when you believe in something, and it is the way of truth, and you make a call, and nobody follows you, you walk alone. It is such a powerful statement, and I've personally experienced that in my life. There are times when you feel all isolated. You believe in something, you've been left out, people don't follow you, but that is the right way. Tagore said you walk alone. Eventually, they will follow it. They will come to the right senses that that was the right path. So we continue the discussion, but I think inclusiveness, gender, race, other areas of community only strengthen the nation and the community. Leaving people out simply hurts the community in a long way and even as short. Even in your neighborhoods, you are more secure if it is a neighborhood in which everybody feels they are participants. You only scare when you are isolated yourself, then you don't sleep well. And I think so. Equality is, is actually peace of mind. It is good for the economy, it is good for people, it's good for the generations. Thank you. Now we will have a question from the audience. This question is uh, from corporate America. For those of you that may have worked in corporate America, I'm going to assume that you the one of the panelists asked. Has there, or was there ever a time when you were trying to move up the ladder and you were not able to get a promotion because of your race? Well, I, can't, I honestly cannot say that that happened because no one ever came right out and said that, you know. Um, but, you know, there are ways, of course, um, that you can tell, hey, something's funny or something's off. Um, what usually happens in situations like that, you know, especially if you were the qualified person, you know, you've met all the qualifications, you have all of the, the talent in terms of whatever technical expertise or whatever expertise in that particular area. Uh, you have the leadership skills and, you know, that there are people who are able to vouch for those attributes that you have. And um, sometimes you can tell, hey, you know, I was really in the running for this position. You know, everyone was, you know, prodding me along. And then all of a sudden it goes to another individual who uh, may be of a different gender, different uh, race or ethnicity. And sometimes they have, uh, less time than you. It's usually those types of things. You can kind of just put the blocks together and kind of draw your own conclusion about it. So usually what ends up happening in corporate America, they're pretty good about not saying it. They, they do it, but you know, they, they, they don't come right out and say it, you know. Um, I guess from that point, you have a decision to make. You know, you can go and try to find out, hey, what happened, which I think would be a good thing to do, just to find out, hey, you know, I thought, you know, I was in the running, I was getting positive feedback, and if you can get something, because maybe there was something you could improve upon. Thank you. 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 Th
you never never really know. Um, I would say that's the first step. But if you, you know, you kind of have to just gauge the situation and then yourself to see, is this worth another try? Or should I start looking elsewhere? Do I need to start maybe making some plans and decisions about my future? So, and even if it, and let's say you really do draw the conclusion or someone comes and tells you, hey, so-and-so got, uh, got it because he, you know, they wanted he, him or, you know, or they wanted her because, you know, they just tell you, because someone may know, may just let you know. Um, I would still say, even in that particular moment, don't internalize it. And I know that's a hard thing to do when you know, hey, I was qualified for this or that, and they chose, uh, you know, someone else over me who was less qualified, but they met certain other uh, physical or gender attributes. Um, I would still say, know your work, and know that this is just uh, an experience and your path going forward, not just for career, but for life. So, and don't be afraid to make some choices. You don't have to, I think a lot of the times, we may feel afraid to move forward, maybe you feel like, oh, we need to work harder, and, you know, maybe and maybe not. But definitely think about your future and plan accordingly for your future, and maybe um, also see maybe about who really is in your corner. I'll speak to that. Um, I am the founder and CEO of Jackets for Jobs, which is a nonprofit organization. So basically, I'm my own boss. So I'm not in a situation where I'm competing against other people um, to move to the next level. You know, being the founder and CEO. But what I do find myself, I have to stay competitional, wondering about moving to the next level and being discriminated against. Would probably be with grants applying for grants and maybe not getting a grant, wondering why I didn't get the grant versus another organization. Um, in corporate America, it's known as that good old boy network. And so it's, you really have to kind of play politics when it comes to being in the corporate world. Because before I started an organization, Jackets for Jobs, which this year we're celebrating our 15th anniversary, so I'm very proud of that. Um, but before I started Jackets for Jobs, I used to hire flight attendants for a major airline. And so I know all about diversity and hiring practices, um, working in that corporate field. And so I was very happy in the position as an employment um, representative hiring flight attendants. Um, and so I left going into my own business. But to say that regarding hiring and trying to go to the next level in the corporate field, it's all about documentation. Because you know they always say, you know, being a black, being a minority, you have to work twice as hard as the next person. And so whatever um, accomplishments that you do, you just make sure that you document them so when it is time for that promotion and someone else gets it, then you will be able to say, I've done X, Y, and Z, and, and what has that person done? So it's just all about keeping that documentation. And somehow, you, um, for me, I found networking is very important, so you really have to be able to network in that good old boy network environment. Any more responses? Um, I just wanted to say, um, I agree with the other panelists. I think they made some good points. And um, I'm pretty pretty new in my career. I haven't really, you know, I've got a promotion, but I mean, it hasn't I've been there a long time, so I really haven't had to deal with that issue. Um, but what I want to say is, um, I think in today's time, uh, we've kind of transitioned to a way, a different way than it used to be, where, whereas, like, I talked to my granddad. And at work, he tells me about some horrible, nasty things that people called him, and they talked to him about back when he was my age, and he was, you know, just starting his career. But I really hadn't had to deal with that outward type of prejudice, that outward type of racism. Um, but I think, you know, as we're progressing as a country, um, we're kind of going into a different uh, subconscious uh, kind of prejudice that people might not even pick up on that they have. Um, so a lot of times if you're in your job, you might be getting discriminated against, but the person discriminating might not know, you might not know, um, it's just it's a subconscious thing. And I think that's, uh, I mean, the instances of uh, just outward racism, hey, you're not going to get this job because you're black, and it's like clearly, clearly obvious, they're going to obviously go down as we uh, go back in time. But um, I think by having discussions like this, everybody wants to be colorblind. But you got to be open about that discussion, so you realize that you're not getting, you're not going to discriminate, or you're not going to be discriminated against. 
Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question, that was really helpful actually. It kind of rolls into our next question. Um, do you think the workforce is becoming more diverse because companies feel compelled to, or do they want to? Describe one. I would probably have to say both. They feel compelled to, but then they want to. And sort of, um, like what Melody said about ESPN, um, should I hire a black or should I hire the most qualified? And they said the answer was yes. Um, so companies do. I work with Detroit Employment Solutions Corporation. Um, I'm one of their um, affiliate agencies um, getting workforce to, um, development together in the city of Detroit. And so it's always a challenge um, hiring because you want to hire the most qualified, and so you want the workforce to be ready. And so right now in the city of Detroit, the, um, the illiteracy rate is very, um, it, it's, it's scary. And so we're trying to do everything that we can to do um, more workforce development training to get people up to speed to be ready for jobs um, for the 21st century. So the answer, I guess, would be um, yes for both. I think the problems that are faced by the corporations today are very complex problems. And you need a lot of different voices around the table, a lot of different faces around the table, a lot of different ideas. And so the smart companies are recognizing they've got to get input from all the different corners to be able to solve some of these problems. There are complex problems, there are interdisciplinary problems. You've got to get everybody around the table. You're not going to solve it with everybody that looks the same and thinks the same and has the same group thing. So I think the smarter companies are picking up on that and realizing we've got to do this. We need different voices around the table. But there are certain, sometimes you can't, if, if sometimes you need that assistance of, look, if you're not going to do that, we need to encourage you to do that. But the smart ones are ahead of the game and say, we need different voices because we've got to solve these crazy difficult problems. Well, uh, we, we learn from history. If we, if we read about history, there are a lot of lessons embedded in the history of nations and civilization. Uh, when Mahatma Gandhi came back from South Africa, where he was the leader of the original uh, civil rights movements, where indentured labor was mistreated in South Africa, he, as an attorney, he was British educated, went to represent them. In 1915, he returned to India where there was this freedom struggle going on. The reason I mention this is the people in India at that time who was enrolled in the struggle for freedom from the British were all three piece British educated, neckties, bow ties, and there was a sort of a club of elitist British educated Indians who were fighting for the cause of freedom struggle. So Gandhi came and said, Look, how are you going to get India free from these people? You look like British. <laughs> there is no difference between you and British people. You are British graduates, you speak English, you wear like them. 85% of India live in villages. Some of have no shoes or no shirts. They are going to follow you because you don't look like them. I think that was a turning point in Indian history, in the, in the modern history of India. Then they started shedding off all the British clothes. That hurt the British Manchester Company because now they were making money from cotton given from India and selling it back the, the, the clothes. So that was the economic issue. But the India changed and Gandhi changed himself. This is a British educated Bharat Law barrister who is having a chapel and a loincloth and that's it. And when he was asked, he said, I want to look like Indians so they can understand me, I can understand them. I'm coming back to, some of you saw Oscar Awards recently. What I'm talking about is representation. If I have a company and majority of my clients are of a particular area, religion, ethnic, gender, so forth, if I don't even include them in the business plan, then it's a bad plan. So if you have a, a group of people making decisions about others in which you do not have representation about people you're making decisions about, even if you mean well, it is probably not the best decision. So I think representation of communities, gender, ethnicity, races, is extremely important for the harmony of a company or a school, of a community or a nation. And fortunately, I must speak about this, that we are very fortunate in America, even if we have issues. It's a free country we can, like today, we can talk about it. We can hammer the table. There are nations, and we must admit that, where people cannot marry into another city 
another state within the country. Foreigners are not allowed to hold their religious meetings. They cannot have a temple or Buddhist or, or Christian or others. So there are countries which carry a flag about discrimination. Yet they want to come and live in this country. They don't have the rights in their own country. They want to come and live here and demand those rights. So I think we have to acknowledge that this is a great nation. If it weren't, why would we all here? You know, there's room to go, right? And 85% American, 85% people who seek visa to change their country, they want to come to the United States. So there are good things here. There are good hard people who elected President Obama because there was a large white population that voted for him. They voted for him not because he's African American, in my view. They voted because he's very intelligent. He outdid everybody in the city. Do you think it was easy to beat Hillary? who had a Democrat party in her pocket? It's because Obama, as they call him, boxing pound to pound, he was better than everybody else. I think when that happens, the doors open. People's biases come down. So my suggestion to our students is, you rise yourself to a level that if you're discriminated, the person who discriminates against you feels shamed. Doors will open. But representation should be there. And we should rise ourselves to a level that resistance, not to hire you, goes lower and lower the time. I just wanted to piggyback off of what you were saying regarding, you know, this is a great country to be in, the United States. Just recently, I was asked to be on a panel um, for the World Islamic Economic Forum in Dubai. And it was a wonderful opportunity to travel to Dubai. You know, you hear all the wonderful things about the country about Dubai and how it's rich and this and that. And so the topic that I spoke about was the rise of women entrepreneurs. And it was really interesting to meet women from all over the world. And afterwards, people came up to me, wow, you're from the United States. I would love to live there. Um, it seems like there's a little bit more diversity, especially for women. They have a little bit more freedom. So we are blessed to be here. And um, this is a, a great country. You spoke about women entrepreneurs in Dubai. Yes, very That's interesting, impressive. yes. Okay, no? Okay. Um, yeah, so the next question will come from the audience. All right, this question is for the Morris Tech staff. Um, I noticed that you have a very small percentage of my uh, black and brown students here. And I was wondering, what do you do to attract more black and brown students to your school? And how do you get um, all your students to uh, communicate and talk about these issues as a school um, and try to avoid the whites with the whites, the Asians with the Asians, the blacks with the blacks, and to try to diversify the school a little bit more. Um, I am an educator myself, and so I kind of look at demographics in schools and as an educator, um, forming relationships with all the students, Talking about diversity, you know, in the classroom, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> talking about diversity in the classroom and getting a, um, more of an awareness of each culture um, in the classroom so that we're all understanding each other and having these open conversations. So what does Lawrence Tech do um, to provide these kind of conversations among all of your students and involve the blacks and the whites together? And how do you go about um, broadening uh, or what about getting students, to, um, of black and brown students into your school? Thank you, it's a good question, let me address that. Um, I am kind of new here, three years uh, on this campus, but I've been in this area, 20 mile area for almost 40 years. So I have seen institutions uh, make strides, some are successful, some are partially, some haven't even tried. This institution, when it was LIT, there were no women here. Black or white, there were no women. Then we, so this is evolving institution. Each leader had to add a piece to open the door for, for better. Circumstances, age of the institutions, social political environment at that time. We are among the best times ever at Lawrence Tech Institution today than we were 15, 20 years ago. Secondly, we have recruiters in every school. Southfield is our home. Southfield has a minority population that is majority at the moment. We want so many of their students in our, 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 
about in our class with an institution. We have recruiters. I just met a few days ago representative of 50 churches in Detroit. These are faith-based leaders led by Pastor Dr. Holly. Many of you may know his name. He's a big name in, in the faith-based area. He brought with him a number of ministers. And I am leading the charge with Dr. Holly to go to the city of Detroit and have 50 ministers go to churches and talk about the Lord's step is your friendly place. You have to qualify. We'll help them qualify. We will give them summer programs, summer workshops, so they are able to come to the level that we admit the students. So we bring them there. So this is one direct effort that we launched just very recently uh, since I came. I personally go to every possible avenue where this discussion occurs and invite people. We have recruited as friends and collaborators and some donors from African American community, from brown communities. I think the need has to be endogenous. Just like you and other educators, those students who are here, when Marsha and other uh, leaders from Lawrence Tech came to me just some time ago, they said, we want to have a chapter of National Association of Black Engineers. I was thrilled because she took the initiative and we launched it, right? And the program is going, we had several events, Friends from other institutions that are friends of our university students came here. We had a hall for one time. So I think this is an evolutionary process. I am personally committed, as I believe my colleagues are, but you will see gradual change. But to see a spike will need everybody else involved. So at least we want to be at a level where we are representative of the community in which we are located. That would be my goal. So my work sort of begins after the students get here. I'm not as directly involved with bringing them here, but the question is how do you include people from all walks of life or uh, all the diversity, all the underrepresented groups? And so uh, I, this is an evolving process for me over the last couple of years, and I've got people in the audience that have helped me with this process, but I have a voice, and I'm, I'm basically representing the white power structure to some extent. And so, but what do I do with that voice? If I just sit quietly in my office and go to class and do whatever, I'm wasting an opportunity. So I can go into all these various different groups and work with these groups and share things that they're doing. So my timeline is half stuff that people send me and half stuff that I kick back out to everybody else on Facebook. Uh, but it's sharing these events and going to these events and then learning from all these different people, all these different quadrants of the campus. And uh, so my voice is there to say, Look, here I am. If you, for whatever reason, if you say, oh, well, Dr. Scott's going to that thing, maybe I should think about going to that thing, then I've used my voice in a good way. So um, it's looking at all these different areas and sharing some of these opportunities and then actually talking with the people at these various events and showing them that, hey, it's fine. The water's fine to come out and go talk to these other people. Look, I'm doing it. Everything, nothing happened to me. So I still got all my limbs and everything. So let's go talk to some of these people too. So that's what I try and do is with my voice, with what I can do, and I'm using my voice yelling at the, uh, the athletics event, so I'm losing some of my voice sometimes. But uh, it's what can I do to share, hey, look, this is, look at these interesting people. And if you miss these people, you're missing out. So. That's what I try to do. I want to add uh, another piece of uh, observation. I think for society to change, a nation or community to change, you need a leader who believes in that change to make that change internally, not for, for faith sake, not for fictitious reasons. So we had to finish that quota, I'm forced to do this. No, I'm not talking. Inside you have to feel that, and there should be a rationale. Case in point, America, was participant in World War I and World War II. We actually tilted in favor of freedom. We were not directly involved, but we helped them win. The armed forces of the United States that won the war, Second World War were disjointed. Blacks and whites did not sit together. They couldn't eat together. They could not march together. Yet, we expected the African-American black at that time to call to die for the country. It was Harry Truman's decision to call on all the leadership saying, how do you expect these boys to go die for you and they can not allow to sit with you and walk with you? It was he who made a legal, uh, illegal 
to separate them. So the armed forces were joined, if I'm correct, during Truman's time by his order. Since then, they have been working together. So it took a leader like him. Truman was a high school graduate. He read the Constitution of America page by page. He tried to overly compensate, so people said, so I'm only a high school graduate. He was one of the most effective presidents of the United States, you know, finding the Marshall Plan, the building of re Europe, United Nations, Israel, uh, railways, and this uh, joining the armed forces. There are many more things he did as a president with that, because he believed in the Constitution, and inside he was a good man. So that's the decision. He made a few other decisions that were very tough, but he owned up to them. And a lot of times, the, the leaders we have, they, they play peekaboo. You know, they, they just don't want to own anything that brings them discredit or, or some negative ratings. But they were leaders, so I think in this room, there are leaders who can stand up and change the society individually or as a group. That's what we need in the country. The underrepresented groups are more interesting than the mainstream groups too. That's what I'm finding. So there's the cool people out there with the interesting stories, they're in the underrepresented groups. So um, I'm learning every single day. The day I don't come to class and learn something from my students, I'm giving up. I'm quitting. So. Any more responses? Well, I'm not faculty here, but um, I would just encourage everyone um, in your classes, if you see someone who I'm sure, you know, does not look like you, um, you go up and introduce yourself, uh, make them your new study partner. That's something that I did uh, a lot during college uh, because quite frankly, those were the people, you know, really the, the hang with. And not only are you getting something from them, they in turn can get something from you. Um, you know, just a new perspective. Maybe, you know, honestly, maybe they have been wrapped up in stereotypes, you know, because, I mean, they're real. But maybe, uh, you know, you would have the opportunity to dispel a lot of those by just sharing, you know, your time, you know, with someone who does not look like you. So, so you could be sort of color gray in a way. Absolutely. Right. <laughs> okay, great. Um, I actually want to piggyback off of Dr. Michael. Um, um, we get a lot of support here um, as far as African American students, especially when they reach out to the National Society of Black Engineers. We know exactly who to send them to um, if they have any issues. Um, Dr. Michael has definitely sat in on one of our meetings and came to our events. He's always with us um, for our, I believe, 14 students that we have as national members. They have all continued beyond their first semester, which is amazing. A lot of uh, African Americans tend to drop out after the first semester here at Lawrence Tech. One, because it's really expensive. Two, because they feel like they have no support. Um, by being the, uh, the National Society of Black Engineers, yes, we have a National Society, but we have this small little family community here, and uh, we do our best to provide uh, support to those students. So. I completely urge you to tell your students about Lawrence Tech. I will give you my card. I will talk to them because Lawrence Tech is a beautiful place to be. But not only are you a group that works to provide support for students that look like you, yes. you also reach out to the rest of the community to say, hey, here are some issues that like the reason we're all up here today. Yeah. So, so not only are you interior, in, interiorly, that's not right. <laughs> so not only are you looking inwardly and being supportive, but you're looking outwardly and doing outreach. Yeah, absolutely. We do uh, mentoring uh, every Friday at Mark Twain Elementary School. Um, but yeah, let's go on. You don't want to see Nishaya's schedule of things she's got to do in the week. <laughs> no, I'm very busy. Um, the next question is, do you believe that you have ever been, oh, well, my, my mom asked that. Oh, that's my mom <laughs> in the audience. <laughs> okay. So the question that we're going to go to now is, how do you respond to negative comments or adversity about your ethnic group? Education. Let me change the, the, the sequence. Mm -hmm. uh, when I came here uh, 73, I was in a meeting with some of the top physicians uh, in the country. Uh, they had this group had not seen much of people who look like me, the brown and, and so forth. 
And when we were having uh, lunch in the cafeteria of a great organization, one of them asked me, I was having, I'm a vegetarian, so I was having a soup, a tomato soup or something, and I was, I had crackers, I just sort of rubbed them and trying to put in my soup. And he asked me, he said, they called me by my initial at that time, VK, as we're in the mood. He said, VK, do they have crackers in India? And I looked at him, I said, what type of education this person has? <laughs> It's a very deep issue here because he never had a, con a conversation sitting somebody next to him right. who looked like me. He probably never read a page about Indian history or technology that they have universities that are rated above Harvard today. Never, never thought about that. That they make planes and ships and you know they, they even supply armaments to other countries. They have IIT which makes NASA and Silicon Valley is all Indian graduates, obviously he never read a paper. So I have to give him a lesson, he was very embarrassed. Uh, the point I'm making is education is the only way. I will, I will venture to also say this, that black and white, Hispanics, brown, black, whatever you call it, they didn't vote for Obama because in my view, because he's African-American, so let's, let's change the system. No, because he was the best candidate. He was far better than anybody else on the ground. And that is always my call, that for us to break the barriers, we must rise up to a level that the person who are not at your equal does not differentiate you, does not say anything at your point, because you're better than him or her. So I think that is a, education is the only way. Some people can do by inheritance. They inherit money. That they got dad's company and all. I'm talking about average American who make big. They make it by hard work and many through education, other by entrepreneurship. That's the road I think we should all take. I think the other thing will disappear. When you're ahead of everybody else, they're going to respect you because they're going to need you more than you need them. So just for my notes, they do have crackers in India. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, so that's Anytime you want. <laughs> well, I do agree that education is the key. Um, as a matter of fact, today, one of my coworkers asked me, uh, Michelle, what, what are you? And I was kind of, you know, a little thrown off, but you know, he didn't, I didn't take it as disrespectful. You know, his tone did not come off that way. But I was kind of surprised that he did ask outright. Um, so I would say that the very first thing um, you should do is just pause, you know, maybe see, you know, for yourself to see where, where was that question really coming from? What place from that person was that coming from? And either way, that is an opportunity for you to educate that individual on, you know, exactly who you are and to you know, give them a brief history lesson if necessary. And so my response to him was, well, would you like the short version or the long version? And he opted for the short, and so I, I let him know, you know, I, I'm black. And um, he, uh, actually, he didn't know that. He, he didn't think that I was. And so I, you know, I told him maybe another time, we can, you know, we both have some time, we could have a more in-depth conversation about it. But, um, you know, I certainly am willing to, you know, explain to anyone who's interested in listening, you know, who I am and where I come from or, you know, who my relatives and ancestors, where they came from. And in turn, I'm, listen I'm interested in listening to their story as well. So the education, it goes both ways. You want to give a lesson, you know, and I, I would say be willing to receive one too. I agree with um, what's been said, education. When, I guess your question is, how do we respond when someone makes a negative comment regarding our race? And I think that I would say it's just educating them because they're ignorant, they just don't know the subject matter. Um, most of you probably watched the Oscars that just took place, what, Sunday night? 
And um, there's a TV show on cable that talks about fashion and they kind of say the do's and the don'ts and who look good and who didn't you know, dress well for the Oscars. And so one of the um, TV reporters talked negatively about one of the black actresses regarding her hair. I'm sure many of you saw that, um, that was on the news this morning. And so she said, oh, I didn't think that her hair was appropriate for the Oscars and she had the locks. And so now she had to come out and make a statement saying that you know, she apologized because she heard um, the actress feeling. So basically it was a, a Caucasian reporter that was saying something negative about a black woman's hair. And that's just because that's out of her comfort zone. She doesn't know um, that subject matter. So it's just ignorance and just educating people. So when people say something negative, it's basically they don't know, they're stepping out of their comfort zone to try to say something. And so we just have to educate them on what they are talking about. Absolutely. I, it, nine times out of ten, it's, it's almost always ignorance. I mean, like people just don't know. And I, but it goes a lot deeper sometimes than just, hey, I'm from here, or this is where my people are from. Uh, sometimes you have to go into, into history. Sometimes you have to go into feelings. Sometimes you have to go into just, just a mindset. And a lot of times people just don't know. People, I mean, if somebody is genuine, you have to be able to uh, just clearly be able to say, Okay, this is what this is why this happens. This is why that happens, and not just kind of say and not get mad and not blow up at somebody. You have to have a clear response to be able to say, you know, this is this is why this happens, and, and not just kind of you know shoot them away. Right? Okay, I agree with all of that. Um, I'm going to make a statement. Um, being young, a lot of us don't realize how we come off when we are telling people you know, about our culture because we think that they're being rude or they're being, they're just treating us wrong. You have to be calm. Regardless of what you do, you have to always just be calm because that's the only way you're going to get what you're saying through to them. Okay, the next question will come from the audience. And as she's coming down, before I forget, and I'm happy to know that you're working with Reverend Holly in Detroit, because when I started Jackets for Jobs 15 years ago, and I was looking for a place to start uh, my organization, I just needed a place to, um, a physical space, Reverend Holly opened his doors, and Jackets for Jobs is actually on the second floor of the historic little Baptist church, so it's nice to know that you're working with them. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you to the panel, and um, thank you. You're doing an excellent job, by the way. Thank yes. you. Um, yes. I think you're doing an excellent job, and, and I, I'm disappointed for a couple of reasons, and I'll say why. But one of the reasons is that you don't have your information on here, and you matter, and you're a part of this. Yes. And so next time, include your information on this brochure. Your mom should be very proud of you. How she matters. She matters. That's right. Um, I, I was also looking at some of the demographics of the school and I was a little disappointed when I came in and saw the number of people or the lack thereof in here. Um, when this is such an important topic that you have brought to Lawrence Tech. So thank you for bringing it to Lawrence Tech. Um, and so my question is to Dr. Um, Magro, and I want to make sure that I'm saying that right because um, I'm an educator and with my students and my staff, I always want to make sure part of being uh, color grade and having those courageous conversations is making sure that we're calling people by their name. Um, one of the things that I wanted to talk about is, um, and, I'm in, and I've been enjoying your conversations thus far in your, this far in your responses, but one of the things I wanted to ask is, um, you talked about what you're doing um, to get more minority students here at Lawrence Tech. And, and what you're doing is, is wonderful. I commend you for going out into those communities and, and letting the, community, the folks know if we're here and we want you to come. Um, but I also heard, on the other hand, that uh, African Americans and other minority populations don't stay. So what, can, what are we doing to retain those populations when they come? And a large part of that, and you talked about um, leadership and, and a leader drives the change, and I'm a leader as well, you're right, but you also need your team. So what is your staff doing to maintain those relationships with the student population here at Lawrence Tech? Thank you, this is a, a very important question for Lawrence Tech. When I came here and we are now into a new strategic plan for the university, which will be released in a few months from Lawrence Tech, it will be called Strategic Plan 2015. The one we are working today uh, is the last phase of 2012 strategic plan. 
So now as a president, I have a chance to have my say into, with my colleagues, the city work is not mine, but I have some say in it. So we have re-identified re what are priorities. The first priority is enrollment, second is retention, third is graduation. Everything else matters. But if we cannot bring them in and move into graduation, we are failing somewhere. So let me happily tell you what we have already done. More needs to be done. When I came here, we were 74% retention rate after first year. That is freshmen going to sophomore, we lost 25% students. In that group, maybe there were many more minorities. This year, we are 84% retention rate. In less than two years, we are 10% above the base we had three years ago. At, and my direction to our group is they're working very hard uh, that we need to be at least in the 90s, which is the top elitist institution are in that level. Now, how it's not going to happen automatically. We, number one, we prioritize. My direction to enrollment management is I want attention. You tell me what you need from me to help you get that. They needed another position. I gave it. So we allocated more resources, different position, to raise the level of some, retention is up. More will happen. So what I call on everyone in the audience is that we are, as a team, better to this principle. And it's going to take time. You know, if something happens overnight, there is something wrong somewhere. It's, it's suspicious. Something change like that, people will fall like that. But we are gradually moving in that direction. I think good days are ahead of us. Congratulations on the improvement. Thank you. The scale going up. OK. So we are coming to like our last 10 minutes. Um, I will ask one more question. How do you think the inauguration of President Barack Obama affected minorities professionally? Um, I think it's uh, your initial, a lot of people's initial thought is that, okay, but African-American man gets to the highest office of the government, he's a leader of the free world, how could that possibly be bad you know, for the African-Americans? But I think it's the opposite. I think it's either no effects or effects negatively. And here's why. Um, negatively, I believe it affects because I think the, the attitude of a lot of people when they see that is that like, oh, racism, everything's over. You know, they kind of you know, wipe their hands from it and they think that you know, everything is good and if you tell them that something's wrong, hey, what about, you got a black president, so that's it. And I think professionally, when you see that, I mean, if you bring something forward and you feel like um, they kind of have a response already in their head, like, oh, great, but, you know, well, everything seems to be going well. I mean, if that affects you negatively because you can't bring anything. Um, or no uh, or no effect because of the same reason, like, uh, but definitely not better. <laughs> well, I would say that there are really no effect. You know, it, it certainly isn't better, and, it, and as far as things being worse, they, I would say that it's pretty much the same uh, in that respect, but I do take it as a very, like, groundbreaking, monumental uh, event to occur that maybe going forward, you know, maybe, I'm not sure if any, if in any of our lifetimes, if we will actually be rid of racism and um, you know negativity towards um, people with uh, differences, but I think it was a major move and stride moving forward. However, in you know present day today, it's it's I would say it's pretty much the same. You still have to work hard. You're not going to get a pass or a pat on the back or you know just. Uh, uh, instantly move ahead. You still have to do your part and do it at the same level and intensity as you've always done, um, you know, to get the things that you want and deserve. So you, you don't get any slack just because you have a, an African American president. But I do think it was a, um, a tremendous event for the next generations down the line. Uh, you know, once we're all gone, maybe you know, things will be different for them, but for now we have to continue moving forward as if it didn't happen, you know, because, you know, none of us are getting preferential treatment, I don't feel, just for that reason. You still have to perform at your best 
as if that is, you know, your personal standard? I would, um, those, are, those are some very good points. Ever since we hired, uh, or not hired, ever since we um, voted and elected um, President Obama, a lot of people were saying now that we're living in a post-racial um, America. You know, like, for example, in my mother's generation, she thought she would never see an African-American president. In my generation, we said, well, maybe we would see an African-American um, president. And then people like, and this young um, boy right here, Gregory, that's all he's known is a black president. So as you can see, the three different generations um, let you know that um, we've come a long way. But then there's a lot of things that we have not come a long way. So I don't think that we live in a post-racial America. I mean, you think about the Michael Brown, Trayvon Martin, Eric Gardner. I mean, that's real, and that's still happening. And if you look at the statistics, some things have improved and some things have not improved. But I'm happy that to see an African-American president. I do like um, Barack Obama, and I really admire um, First Lady Michelle Obama. But we have come a long way, but there's still a long way to go. But I think it's also the aspirational or inspirational, to be able to see somebody that looks like you in whatever, whichever category you want to be in, if you only see the other, the majority out there, then you think, well, I don't know, can I really do that? Or can anybody really do that? So to be able to see somebody that's different from the majority that's always out there, and you look at the majority of the Senate, and this is, you know, how white is the Senate? And how white is the House of Representatives? Although that's less, represent, less white, but you've got, all men dealing with women's reproductive issues on Senate panels. How are they going to get any kind of uh, sense of, oh, I think this is going to, this panel's going to make a good decision here. So to be able to see somebody that looks different from the normal slate of every single other president's been a white president, uh, I think that lends some some uh, ability to dream, some more more of an ability to dream. You know, any child can be president of the United States. Well, that's even more real now. Exactly. And then when you get a woman president, it's going to be opening up that gender to, oh, wait, look, we've got an example of here's a woman president. Here's, so then you're going to have an LGBT president. And everybody's lining up on who wants to be the next first one to be the president. But I think there's an aspirational sort of thing of I can do that because, look, I've seen other people like me do that. Now, there has to be the first that gets up there to do, that does that, that doesn't have the role model in front of them. But I think so many people need that dream of this is something that I can do because I see people that look like me up there. That's all I've seen as president. I don't have any desire to be president, but that's all I've seen. But now everybody else gets another shot at seeing somebody that looks like them up there. It, at my uh, previous institution, I was in charge of eight charter schools in the city of Detroit. And uh, my predecessor hadn't seen where those schools are. I insisted I want to go to Detroit and I want to see each school visit, talk to the staff and students. Some charter schools were graduate middle school, some were high, some were um, grade five and so forth. And the change in the context of this question that has happened is so emphatic and so powerful. Before that, the little kids have old models, you know, they had the images pasted with self and tape on the walls. Those have disappeared. It was all President Obama everywhere. I think there is a big, big issue here because the children now growing up, they have different role models than they were given before. And I'm not going to speak about any individual, but with President Obama's picture on every, and they deleted everything else or pasted on top of them because they see a very different, highly intellectual, educated, uh, one of the best speakers and on and on and on, and one of them. It is a totally different model that they have than they have. It's, all leaders are good when they mean well, but I think that is a change in the young age. Little children saying, I want to be like him. That didn't happen before. The kids probably did not even have the feeling I can be there. But I think that door has opened. So I think with time, as we evolve as a nation, as a community, more people of eminence will get into that role. And we all have to work on that. I have to again emphasize that when you're that good, doors do open for you. People feel it is unreasonable for one not to give credit where it belongs. Large number of white people voted for President Obama. 
So I think we've got to give some credit to people that when this evolution is happening, more doors are opening. He could not become president only after a man vote, right? A lot of people, a lot of young college graduates, again, education-based, a lot of cell phone use, the, the, the heavy technology use, and they came in drones to support him. That is a change in our society. But I think we have a long way to go. My friend already talked about Indira Gandhi, Golda Meir, Benazir Bhutto, uh, uh, Margaret Thatcher. We don't have a president, woman president yet. I think that is also coming, whether it's African American or other, but, but I think we only got the voting right very late compared to other countries. So we are moving in some systems, I think that is due too, but with time it will happen. And happily, good things are happening. They are probably not at a rate we like them, and we can help them accelerate. So Lady Gaga and Beyonce, it's a double ticket for the next. <laughs> you know what he watches. <laughs> but I just think that that's wonderful for a six-year-old right now. The only president they, that they know is a black man. Right. You know, my generation, like I said, in my parents' generation, that was totally unheard of. So they can look now and say, wow, I can be the president of the United States. You know, I have a role model now. And as you say, the next person being, if she's a woman, they'll say, wow, now I really can do it. I can see a woman that's in that role. But also think about the, the six-year-old white kid that is only known as a black president, too. So exactly. here is a role model where here is a president. Oh, that's the president. So mm -hmm. I, uh, it's, they're seeing somebody that doesn't look like them that's president, and that's all they've known. So. Good point, right. There is another change I must say that is happening personally. I want to share that. In, in the show time I have once in a while to socialize, there are groups who are from my generation or older generation. Very hard to change them. Their kids are not biased at all. They actually tell their parents not to say that. Don't think that way. That's a great change in the next generation. The older guard, which grew up under biased condition, is moving away. So you have young people from schools and colleges who are actually devoid of these biases, and they're looking for what is right, what is wrong, rather than what is black and white. I think that number is increasing. So we have a good future for the country. Okay, it's time to wrap up. study and stay in school and don't do drugs and all you young people. <laughs> okay, so um, everyone, let's give a round of applause for our candidates. you all for coming out and as a token of our appreciation we have $20 gift cards. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, we would also like to thank our partners, uh, the National Organization of Minority Architects, the Lawrence Tech Student Government, and our sponsor Eaton for helping us out. We appreciate everyone's dedication and, and being here and um, we really hope that you go home and think about being color brave and also inspire others to be color brave. Have a good night. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you.